Um, this is how we discovered the Higgs boson in uh, almost 10 years ago in uh, 2012, uh, which actually completed the so-called standard model. Um, but there's other fundamental questions which remain un unsolved, and we hope that the LHC can give us the answers in the next 10 years. So just to highlight some of these questions, for example, one, one of them is, why is gravity so weak? So what we mean by this is, for example, if we have two protons that are, say, one centimeter apart, then the electromagnetic force that attracts them together is much stronger uh, than the gravitational ripples. And that's very curious. So a couple of possible answers that we have here are supersymmetry or extra spatial dimensions, which will sort of weaken the effect of gravity. Uh, then the other question is, what's the origin of dark matter? So for example, we know that uh, the great majority of the mass in the universe is actually dark. So we don't see it. It doesn't interact with us in any other way except gravity. Uh, and we hope we could probably, we could maybe produce it um, directly at LHC. Um, another interesting question is why we have matter at all. Um, so the point is here that all processes that we know, and all processes that we produce at LHC, um, produce roughly equal amount of matter and antimatter. And when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate and turn into light. Uh, so there must have been some process in the early universe which created more matter than antimatter. Uh, we just don't know what it is. And so the last question here is neutrinos. So neutrinos are very curious. Uh, we know they have mass. We don't know why they have mass. Uh, and we also don't know if neutrinos are their own antiparticles or not. Uh, so these are some of the questions which we hope to answer. And um, I'll go through more details about the Atlas detector it itself. So Atlas is a very large uh, machine that's really designed to detect the smallest particles. Um, so here I'm just comparing it to the size of the NERSC building for fun. Uh, so you can see it's sort of roughly the same size, so a bit larger than, than this building if you look at it from the side. Uh, so it's really very large. It's 46 meters long, 25 meters wide. It weights um, uh, 7,000 tons. And it's equipped with strong magnets up to 3.5 Tesla, which bend the uh, trajectories of particles uh, so that we can measure their momenta. Um, so slide seven shows sort of how the collisions look like. Uh, so this is now the transverse plane in the Atlas detector. So it's the cutoff in the transverse plane. Um, and roughly we have more than a billion proton-proton collisions per second. So that's a huge number. And we're not able to save all of them to disk uh, because we have limited resources and there's no technology that allows us to do this. So roughly we save about 25,000 or a bit more um, collisions per second which gives us around 20 billion events um, in the data taking period between 2015 and 2018. And this requires huge disk space, for example, more than 100 petabytes. Um, and because of this, we also need huge computing resources to process all this data and get physics results. Um, so to make things even worse, on slide eight, so the way we uh, interpret the data is that we compare it to theory. Um, but to get accurate theory predictions, we need Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation means that we create proton-proton collisions one by one using random number generators. Uh, so for example, I have one illustration here. Um, so we create this proton-proton uh, collisions with generators. Then we have to simulate them, meaning that we simulate the response to the Atlas detector. Uh, for this, we're using the so-called GN4 toolkit, uh, which I'll talk about more later on. Um, and once we simulate the response, then we can use the same reconstruction software as used for the real data collected with the Atlas detector and LHC um, to reconstruct the events. And then we can uh, make statistical analysis and get physics, physics results. Now, crucial um, thing to mention here is that to not have large statistical uncertainties, we actually need to simulate more events than uh, we have actual collisions. And I said we had about 20 billion collisions, and we also simulated about 60 billion um, events so that we, that we are able to analyze this data. Um, so these are huge numbers, and the only way we can tackle this is using the uh, so-called worldwide computing grid. Usually we just call it grid for short. Um, so this is a connection of um, around 170 sites uh, between 42 countries in the world, and it gives us roughly 1 million computer cores. Uh, so this is just one screenshot from one particular day in the past, uh, but um, the global transfer rates can exceed 
uh, this, the, the, the 60 gigabytes per second. Um, and uh, th that's how we really, really can meet the competing demands uh, of the LHC experiments. And uh, now in more details on slide 10, uh, this is sort of how, uh, which this shows, this graph shows which computing resources are mainly used in Atlas. Um, and you can see this sort of uh, yellowish color corresponds to so-called grid. So these are regular grid sites. Um, and there's some small fraction of HPCs uh, starting to increase since 2020 or so. Uh, for example, you have this dark blue uh, called HPC special, and this corresponds to, um, for example, Corey Kano. Um, and then there's also other HPCs, for example, um, in 2021, we included uh, the Vega HPC actually from my home country, Slovenia. Uh, so you can see a large spike here. And then uh, a couple of months back, we also had addition of Carolina from uh, Czechia. Both of these were part of the UHPC project. Um, but you can see utilization of HPC is increasing. So uh, we need to be able to use them efficiently um, in order to do the analysis. Uh, so just a breakdown here on slide 11 of what we are using the CPUs for. Um, so there's many components here, but the largest one, uh, the blue one, is a Monte Carlo simulation. So this corresponds to what I was saying before about simulating the, the detector response with the Jennifer 4 toolkit. And it turns out, depending a bit on the year and so on, about 40 to 50% of all Atlas CPU hours are spent on, uh, on this workflow. Um, so obviously it's important to speed this up if we can. And there's in fact a huge uh, effort uh, uh, to make this run faster. And I was also working on this. I actually achieved a 20% speed up, um, but it's not in this talk. I just have a link to the paper here. Um, but then other solutions uh, that we can do here is to actually optimize this workflow to run more efficiently on non-conventional sites such as HPCs. And the focus on this talk is running this particular workflow uh, uh, on HPCs uh, such as Core. Uh, just a bit more, uh, more uh, motivation before I move on is this projection of the CPU needs. Um, so the plot shows years from 2020 to 2024 uh, and the colored points, for example, blue and red, um, uh, show how much resources you're expected to need under certain uh, scenarios. Um, and then the solid black lines are the projections of how much resources you have available. Um, and the point here is that we expect to have enough uh, resources to tackle the computing issues um, but we will need to be able to use them efficiently. And many of these could be HPCs uh, in the future. Okay, so first I'll overview how we are running uh, simulation on the regular grid sites. And then I'll compare the difference to HPCs so uh, I can better illustrate the issues that we face on HPCs. Um, so firstly, we're using the so-called um, uh, PANDA system, which is, stands for Production Distributed Analysis System. And this is where we aggregate all of the tasks uh, in the Atlas collaboration. So it's a central database. Any user can uh, submit tasks. Any user that's around 3,000 physicists that are around the world from any institution. So we can also submit tasks to this Panda server. And then the Panda server delegates the work to grid sites. Um, so here on grid sites, we have a software called Pilot, which receives the job. Um, but in order to do this, we need HTTP communication between uh, the sites and the Panda server. Um, okay, now once we are on the site, uh, we will use Athena, which is the main software processing framework. Um, and in this particular case, when we're running simulation, we're using so-called Athena MP, which is the multiprocess version. Um, and here, just the point is that um, uh, we first have an initialization step in this uh, Athena software, which basically loads the detector geometry, uh, magnetic field, and so on. Um, and then we do a fork of this process, and we start the so-called worker processes. Now, these worker processes can share some of the memory, such as detector geometry, uh, magnetic field. Um, and then they start processing events in parallel. So events here are really uh, different proton-proton collisions. And this is the smallest unit of process that, that we can possibly have in this scheme. Um, and then in addition, we're using the event service mode here, where we can provide input events on demand from an external application. So the number of events that we want to process does not need to be determined in advance if we're using the DNMP with the event service mode. 
Um, okay, so this is how we're processing events on one node. Um, and now coupling this with the Panda server. Uh, so we're going to submit multiple tasks on various grid sites, and then each grid task we run a separate Athena MP instance on one node. That's, for example, illustrated here. In this case, we have a Athena MP process uh, with eight worker processes. So at the beginning, we have some initialization time. Then we start processing events in parallel. Um, and here, one thing to note is that the processing time of one event is unpredictable and it varies. So it can be from two to 30 minutes. Um, so really the runtime of the task is determined uh, by the completion of the last event. So in this case, when, you, when we complete event 15, we're done. Um, but because of this granularity of one event, there's some dead time here at the end, uh, which is basically lost CPU um, and we cannot really avoid this. Um, so this is not really a big issue, um, not in one note, but you will see this doesn't translate well directly uh, to HPCs. Um, so here on slide 17, I'll cover the issues in HPC. So firstly, um, depending on HPC, but Q policies generally disfavor single node tasks uh, for large workload. So for example, if you want to run something on Core KNL, there's no shared queue available, which you would typically use for a single node job. Um, also, the charge CPU hours may be larger um, compared to multiple multi-node jobs. So already at HPCs, we want to run multi-node uh, tasks as opposed to single node tasks. And then second point is that networking may not be generally available on HPC compute nodes. And this could be an issue because in these conventional grid tasks, we need actually HTTP uh, to retrieve the task info from the Panda server. Um, and then the third point, which is perhaps the uh, most important ones, is the treating nodes as independent, um, as independent processing units creates large inefficiencies. Uh, so I have this illustrated um, below. This is how we would just naively run uh, our uh, simulation on multi, uh, multiple nodes. So for example, in this case, we would start on a job with eight nodes. And on each node, we would just run an Athena AMP instance with say two, two cores, two, two processes. And we would instruct each one to process 1000 events. Um, and because this processing time varies, uh, here we would get much larger inefficiencies at the end. So for example, seven of the nodes would already finish processing, but then we have to wait for the final one um, to actually finish the job. And this would be lost, uh, lots of lost CPU um, hours while waiting for the last process to finish. So that's something we would like to avoid if possible. And this is where our solution um, comes in. Uh, so this is, exactly what we wanted to solve. Uh, now, um, this is the conceptual uh, design of the solution on slide 19. So first of all, we treat all nodes in the tasks as a single process, and then we create a central application that feeds events one by one um, to each node on demand. Uh, so it looks sort of like this. We have uh, uh, one central application, which we call driver, uh, that has access to the shared file system. And then we have other nodes, where we run this in an MP um, application on each of the nodes. And then instead of treating them as independent, uh, we control them centrally and we feed them events one by one. Uh, so basically by uh, having this fine granularity at the event, at the event level, uh, we reduce the inefficiency uh, that would occur at the end of the, at the, end of the job. Um, so now technically how we implemented this was using the uh, Ray framework. So Ray is a very commonly used uh, nowadays framework for distributed computing. It has a very simple uh, Python API, API to express parallelism and data dependency. Um, so for example, this is just a screenshot from, from their uh, GitHub page. You can see it's widely used by the community. Uh, it has integration with many other libraries and also it's developed by Rise Lab at UC Berkeley. So we have a connection also locally. Um, but basically how it works is illustrated on this plot below. Um, uh, so, so we, in this case, we have three nodes. So these are separate HPC nodes and we have a driver application on one of them, which controls the whole thing. Um, and on this head node, we also have the so-called global control store, uh, which is basically using a Redis server uh, to establish connection between the various nodes. Um, so these worker nodes uh, connect to this Redis server 
on the main node using TCP IP connection. Uh, this is how we establish the Ray cluster. And then uh, the Ray framework automatically schedules the assigned work on all available resources in the cluster. So that's really the nice feature here is that we don't have to uh, worry about scheduling because Ray does the scheduling itself and it does it in a smart way so that we utilize all, all available resources. Okay, so slide 21 now shows the actual architecture of our uh, solution here called Retina. Um, so firstly, uh, we have exactly one Ray process on each node in the cluster. So it's either a Ray driver, uh, which is the main process or a Ray actor. So actor is a special um, uh, process in Ray, which uh, keeps its state. Um, and then inside each of the actor, uh, inside a shifted image, uh, we start this Athena MP process, which is going to process our uh, protoprotic region events. And this, this process will have 32 or processes on a Haswell or 134 on KNL. Um, and then this driver process uh, feeds events one by one on demand uh, to the processes in the other nodes. And depending on how many nodes we have, this can be up to 1,000 events uh, per second that have to be uh, coordinated across the nodes. Um, then we also write the output to the file system through the driver process uh, to, to keep the output centrally. And this enables us to do a uh, checkpointing. So we can stop this process at any time and we know how to continue because we have the output already saved locally. Um, okay, now this is an example of how this uh, system performs. Uh, so that's an example with two Haswell nodes. And the way to interpret this plot is uh, you have the beginning of this initialization step. Uh, so uh, this is where we start up the Athena and below the geometry and the, the uh, magnetic field. And this is common to all worker processes. And once this step is performed, we actually fork this process across 32 uh, on Haswell across 32 worker processes. And then they start processing events one by one. And this is what each of the blocks corresponds, corresponds to here. So each of these blue rectangles is a separate event that we, that we have processed. And you can see there's almost no white spots between the events, meaning that this is highly efficient. There's basically no downtime. And we were able, in this case, to provide events um, uh, fast enough so there was, there was no downtime. Down um, okay, we also done various scaling tests here. Uh, and in this simple example, we went up to 200 KNL nodes. And actually, on KNL, we're using, uh, we're running Athena with 134 processes. So if you combine this, combine this that's more than 25,000 um, processes running in parallel that we can control centrally for one application and feed them events. Um, also, in this case, we did not find any bottlenecks. And this is one of the plots from Julian, uh, where, where he shows, um, depending on how many nodes in a cluster we have, what's the average latency between the events. And it's basically constant, and it's about 0.5 seconds, um, which again shows that we don't have any bottlenecks in this, uh, in this system after 200 nodes. Um, good, so that's sort of the first part. Uh, this was the proof of concept uh, where we demonstrated that we can run on Cori uh, distributed computing frameworks such as Ray uh, to parallelize the Atlas Gen 4 simulation on HPC. We had no issues in scaling up to 200 nodes. Um, and basically, we solved this bottleneck of having to wait for the last node to finish uh, by having a fine granularity at the event level. Uh, now, the next step of the project was to actually integrate this in the Atlas uh, Panda system, uh, because this is what you would need to run this in production. And the two main components here, uh, which are needed, are to use this Harvester project uh, software for communication with Panda, and then the pilot software, which is an uh, intermediate layer between the reactor and Athena. Um, and again, this is what Julian really did great. Uh, and this was part of his uh, master's thesis. Uh, this integration work. Uh, how am I doing on time? Yes, it's good. Okay, so now firstly, um, in this integration, I'll start with uh, Hardwester. Um, so Hardwester is the software um, which talks to the Panda server and retrieves the job info from the central server um, and then starts the uh, processing on, on Cori. 
so this is an application that runs as a daemon uh, on an edge node. Um, so it's running all the time. And in this case, we used Quarter 21. So we got special permissions um, to use this node. And, and the harvester application constantly uh, uh, keeps HTTP connection with Panda. Um, and we wait for some user or a prod system uh, to submit a task, which is suitable for uh, Cori. Uh, and then this harvester application starts uh, the Retina job using Slurm. Um, and then here we have the uh, Retina application running, as I was explaining before. Um, but these two communications still need to communicate, communicate uh, while the job is running. And uh, this communication is implemented via um, a shared file system communication. So basically, they are both creating uh, text files with info, and they are exchanging these text files. Uh, then on the other side, we also um, need to retrieve the input files uh, from grid. So for example, the, the files which we're going to process are not already located in Cori. Um, and here we were using the Globus uh, software to actually retrieve the inputs uh, from wherever the input was in some other grid side. And then we also have to write back this uh, output uh, again to grid. Um, all right, so this is uh, Harvester at the um, start of the start of the integration. And then uh, the other part of the integration is using the pilot software. Um, and pilot is something that's already been designed um, to handle communications with Athena MP. Um, in addition to doing this communication, it also saves uh, all sorts of diagnostics and log files. And this is useful um, for running in production because then if something goes wrong, we can easily investigate these log files and figure out what, what went wrong. Um, and actually here we wanted to mimic exactly the behavior that regular grid jobs um, have where pilot is directly connected to Panda. And for this reason, we implemented this um, HTTP communication here. So we have the Ray actor on one node, which in the pilot process on the same node, and we have local HTTP communication between them. Um, this was to mimic how this is usually uh, run on, on grid sites. Um, so here one difference corresponding to the original version where we had this event level granularity is that pilot now is already designed to have a cache of n events where n is the number of uh, Athena worker processes. So this uh, fine granularity of event by event level is now uh, reduced to n events, but it's still very fine and doesn't produce any bottlenecks at the end of the process. Um, okay, now when we put all this together, this is how it looks like. Uh, so at the edge node, we have the harvester application, which uh, receives the job info from the Panda server, then does the batch submission, starts up the RAID driver, which has a Redis server. Um, the Redis server is used to have this TCP IP connection uh, with all nodes in the cluster. And then on each of the nodes, we have our actor, uh, which runs this pilot application and has HTTP communication with the pilot application. And the pilot application eventually runs the Athena MP, uh, which is our processing software for running design for simulation. Um, so now this scheme allows us to run, um, uh, to run this kind of jobs through the central Panda system. And we can run a multi-node HPC application and the nice thing here is that really any, any physicist in the Atlas collaboration um, can submit such a job and get access to, uh, uh, to this kind of a multi-node application. Um, but because we added all these additional layers, it became significantly more complicated uh, as the original application. And also now we're using multiple communication channels, which is maybe not uh, the nicest. For example, shared file system communication, TCP, IP, HTTP. Um, Okay, so slide 29 now shows you a diagram of how um, uh, this looks like in practice. So this is an example where we have 50 KNN nodes and 134 processes um, per node. Um, and now I'm showing more things than before. So at the beginning, this uh, small gray um, uh, area is actually the initialization of the array process itself. And it's, this is a very short period. Um, and then in, in, in addition to initializing Catina, we also need to initialize this pilot process, which takes some time. Um, but after everything's initialized, which in KNL can take sort of a level of 10 minutes, 
um, then we start processing events. And again, you can see this has almost no white spots. So it's running really as efficiently as it can. Um, in this example, you can see there's some white spots all, all at the same time. And in this particular case, we assume it's something to do with the high load and the shared file system, um, but this is not something we would usually see. Um, and then at the end of the job, I'm also showing you this uh, green lines. And these are events which we started processing, but never finished uh, because the job terminated after a certain time. In this case, um, was two and a half hours. So we terminated the job and then every event that we were processing, but we didn't finish is lost. But this efficiency is something we cannot really avoid um, because we cannot uh, process units smaller than one event. Um, so all in all, this, this is highly efficient. Um, and runs Could you say, and so um, this is about 20 minutes of initialization time? Is that what, you, what this means? Yes, exactly, yeah. Well, what's happening in that? Um, so, so let's, so the blue one is easy to explain. So the blue one is when we start up Athena and it has to retrieve um, the detected geometry and load it in memory. It has to retrieve the uh, magnetic field loaded in memory. And this turns out it's quite slow in KNL. In KNL. Usually it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so it's just, it just has to fill up the memory with, with all the relevant data that we need to process the process the events. This is like file per pro file per process input or something. So it's accessing databases and all and this kind of stuff. Oh. So, so actually to avoid, so usually we would do this via network, um, but we wanted to avoid having to access network. So here we had a shifted image, which had this database saved in the image. So the image was around eight gigabytes large, gigabytes large. Uh, and then Athena has to access these databases and retrieve the relevant information. How much faster is it if on, on Haswell? Uh, so I believe I have one example from, uh, from a different process here, yeah. Um, so this is one example I have from uh, Argon where we had Xeon processes. And here you can see it's a bit faster, but it's still, still a significant time. So that's, yeah, that's something we, have, we are fortunately cannot avoid. And the only way to mitigate is, is to actually run longer jobs, right? So because once we have this initialized, we can continue running for as long as we want. Um, so, right, so this we can mitigate by running the job longer. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, okay, so slide 30 just summarizes the current status of this. Uh, so we have successfully uh, demonstrated running multi-node with Hina tasks through the Atlas production system. And we've tested this up to 200 um, core KNL nodes. In addition, we also tested this system uh, on other HPCs such as uh, Xeon nodes at Argon. Um, and and the, the reason for this is the whole system was designed to work on uh, multiple HPCs because we, we want one solution that we can use um, on any uh, site in Atlas. We don't want to develop a different solution for every site. Um, but we did actually run into some scaling issues uh, once we uh, uh, did this integration with Harvester and Pilot. And particularly one of the issues uh, was actually collecting the output uh, binary files and log files. So, so this job you can imagine produces lots of output files. Um, in fact, we produce one output file per event and we can process hundreds of thousands of events here. Um, and then we need to collect this output and send it out to grid storage. And this in principle is performed by Harvester, which sits on the edge node. Um, but in our particular case, it created a very high load on the file system, especially once we started running 200 or so nodes. And that basically it could just crash the entire node or, or broke the whole node. So that's something which is not yet solved and requires, um, requires some, uh, um, we need to work together with the Harvester team. Um, but in general, we also need to do some more stress tests. For example, um, in some cases, Ray may not be entirely stable, um, which is sometimes difficult to reproduce. Um, 
So, right, so we need to figure out this kind of issues before this can really be certified and ready for use in uh, Atlas production. Um, also, one, one of the issues I would like to point out here is a uh, more sociological one, that it's actually quite difficult uh, in the physics community to find interest for this kind of work. So for example, I was the main developer on this, but I already transitioned to a 100% physics job. Um, so I'm not really uh, working on this um, uh, to any large extent. Um, so that's one of the other issues as well. Um, okay, so I'd like to give some outlook as well. Um, so one nice thing about this whole uh, system is that Retina actually establishes the connection between the Panda server um, and array cluster on an HPC where we can have a cluster with 200 or so nodes. Um, and you can imagine swapping out this Athena MP payload um, with some generic payload um, which can be written by any user. Um, and then this basically means that any user in the Atlas collaboration can submit a job which utilizes the whole array environment, uh, which has integration with all sorts of beautiful libraries, uh, for example, machine learning. Um, so essentially you could run something like distributed XGBoost um, uh, for distributed machine learning on a HPC cluster of hundreds of nodes. And you can do this, you could submit this kind of a job from anywhere in the world um, through this Panda system. Um, yeah, so potentially it's very useful for um, any other application that requires um, lots of nodes um, to run efficiently. Uh, and uh, just the last slide to summarize. Um, so the Atlas experiment at the LHC has recorded about 20 billion uh, proton proton events. Um, to interpret this data, we simulated about 60 billion events. Um, and to process all this, we need enormous um, CPU power. Uh, in the future, this CPU power that we need will only grow because the rate at which we uh, collect the data is going to increase. Um, and efficient utilization of HPC resources um, is crucial to meet this kind of uh, computing demands. Um, so this presented Retina work is a framework based on Ray uh, for, distribu for distributed Atlas gen for simulation across multiple CPU nodes. Uh, we have shown scaling tests that work well up to 200 or so nodes, uh, where we have more than 25,000 processes in parallel. Uh, we see great efficiency with almost no downtime uh, between the events of the process. That's thanks to the fine granularity, which we could implement. Um, it solves the bottleneck of having to wait a long time at the end uh, for the last job to finish. A bit more work is needed before we can have a production ready version. Um, and all in all this integration of Retina with the uh, central Atlas server also opens up an exciting possibility of distributed uh, of, of distributing, distributing other workflows, uh, such as, for example, machine learning on HPCs. Okay, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that was, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a pretty impressive body of work and, and workflow that you've put together here. Um, it's really, it's really exciting for us to see various technologies, enabling technologies being used like the, like the, the container um, capability in Shifter and uh, you know, Globus and, and various other things um, that you mentioned. And you know, we're working more and more to design systems that will more easily support um, this kind of computing, this kind of workflow, this kind of approach to things um, like enabling direct um, network um, ethernet access to compute nodes and things like that. Um, so yeah, and I, I, I appreciate your comment about the, um, the workforce as well. I mean, this is, this is really um, a work that enables so much of, I mean, it, it's critical to enabling, you know, the whole system to be able to work. And so it's really, it's really important uh, that people do it and that people really get recognition for it. And so I want to, want to recognize you for this. And I hope, I hope this work continues to get um, a lot of usage uh, going forward. So with that, um, I'm happy to open it up to questions, I think. Roland. Okay, all right. Um, I had a question about um, 
uh, the fact that you had um, the cluster running on one partition or the other, so you had one kind of node, but um, available to you, right? K and L or Haswell, you couldn't um, pick to have the scheduler be one kind of node inside, you know, inside the compute partition, right? Um, you, you couldn't set up something where like within the job allocation, you had one kind of node and then all your workers be some other kind of node that were maybe more optimal for, for doing the event processing. So is it interesting to you to be able to have within a single job allocation, being able to have multiple different kinds of nodes doing different roles um, for this kind of event processing? Like if you could have had that, would you have liked that better than what you had to do here? Or is it not that big a deal? Well, that's a very interesting comment. So uh, first I'll say um, the reason why we were using um, KNL here. Um, so, so actually, so this Atlas Jam for simulation, we, we found it runs actually quite slow in KNL compared to Haswell, um, but still given the uh, costs of CPU hours and KNL compared to Haswell, uh, we found it to be more efficient to run this this kind of stuff on KNL because we can have 134 processes, um, and it turns out to be that we can have a higher throughput uh, given some finite uh, CPU hour allocation on KNL. But having said that, uh, we have also this today Java application with the Reddit server, and perhaps indeed it's not really optimal to run this in KNL. Um, and in this case, we had one entire node dedicated just to running this Reddit server because we didn't want to risk also running this huge uh, CPU load on the same node. Um, but certainly that's something which might run better if, if you're running this in Haswell. So for example, yes, if we could have one Haswell node and then other KNL nodes, maybe this, this could actually uh, uh, be quite good. Thanks. This is Haya. I'm going to ask you a question. Hey, um, uh, so it, was there a, any sort of uh, like uh, resilience features uh, set up for Rapina so that if like a node went down or if the shared file system was struggling or some sort of um, diff, you know infrastructure issue was arising that it would know how to fail or alert the user that something was wrong or recover? Yeah, no, that's yeah, not a great question. So um, to a large extent, we solve this by, um, by saving the out. So as soon as we process one event, maybe if I go to one of these plots here, um, as soon as we process one event, uh, we immediately uh, save it to a common location on the shared file system. Um, so if for some reason the job uh, closes unexpectedly, uh, we, we know how much events we processed, and then when we submit the next job, we can just continue from where we, we left off. So in this sense, we have checkpointing, which works very well. Um, another question I think was, what happens if you're running like 200 nodes and one of, one of the nodes dies for some reason? So this is something we were uh, debating what we should do here. Um, currently, in this case, we will just shut down the, no, uh, the entire job um, so that we don't have any inefficiencies. But um, that's something which one would start and optimize and Perhaps we could, Ray certainly Ray has capabilities that we could decide to keep running even if one of the nodes is down. Um, but at the moment we were just uh, terminate the entire job. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Yeah, so I was wondering about, I was watching your plots where you showed what happens at the end of the job, right? Where you have these processes that get killed um, when the job ends. And it actually looks to me like it's quite a significant fraction of time um, that you actually lose um, from this effect. Are there any ideas that you thought about how this could be um, improved in the future? Because it's not clear to me that it would necessarily be so easy to run these jobs for a huge amount of time, right? Which would mitigate the impact of these events which start but didn't finish. Yeah, so, um, right, so the, so the easiest way to mitigate is to run this in a uh, much longer time, but this may not be possible again with the queue policies. And in this example, we were using the flex queue, um, again, which has a very low cost and we could use the flex queue because we don't really care for how long the job runs. 
because you have checkpointing. Um, yeah, but there's not really any easy way to uh, solve this because we are limited by this event level um, granularity. Now, with lots of development, uh, one could imagine uh, using this kind of a system for the next version of Athena called Athena MT, uh, which actually breaks down this event level granularity into smaller pieces. So in the next version of Athena, which we're going to use in around three, so sort of in the next five years, uh, it's going to be running in multi-threaded uh, multi as opposed to multi-process. And we will have a finer granularity of work than one event. So we will divide every event into so-called algorithms, which we execute in, in a way to uh, respect the data dependencies. Um, and in this case, one could imagine having such a system that's that runs across multiple nodes and has a finer than event level granularity. Uh, but that's something which would require uh, some significant developments, but could potentially make this a bit nicer at the end. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we, we thought a little bit about this for shooting in things like this. And I guess this is a, a, a fine grained, um, you know, view um, on a node, but, you know, one, one thing we can do with the scheduler is, is be able to um, allow, allow jobs to release resources if they're done with them after a certain amount of time, but maybe other resources are not done with. Um, that's, that's one thing we've been thinking about. Another thing, if, if you go back to slide 22, um, so that, that packing as it was, is, is really quite good. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I think. But is so is each one of those um, rows, as it were, uh, kind of randomly a given uh, work as something finishes? You know, you say you can't really you can't really predict the length of of time for one of those, is, and and so is that kind of a a distribution that arose from kind of a random round robin type of thing? Yes, exactly. So so as soon as one of this is finished. Um, so this is called sort of a worker process. Uh, and we have one of one base process here, um, sort of the initial you know, MP process. So this worker process uh, tells the base process that it ran out of work. And then the base process talks first to the reactor and the reactor talks to the red driver. And the red driver then sends an input event to this worker process. Um, but this all happens very quickly. So you've seen this happens quicker than in a 0.5 second. Um, ah, okay. And right, so it's really, as soon as we run out, as soon as we process one event, then this one worker process out of thousands of worker process, processes uh, requests an event and it's going to get it very quickly. Uh, so, and so we were sort of also surprised this worked so well for such a large number of nodes. So the length of these of time in one of these um, blue rectangles is is not that much. So, so yeah. one thing I was wondering, I guess, is um, you know, I guess the difference between the runtimes is based on some random input configuration. Is that true? So, um, um, so this this sort of thing is very chaotic, chaotic uh, in this sense. So um, these are typically going to be same kind of uh, physics processes, for example, a Higgs boson decaying in a certain way, but depending on which, at which angle it hits the other detector, uh, it may take a significant longer uh, uh, to simulate because some parts of the detector are much slower to simulate than others. Um, and it's very difficult to predict. So, um, because for example, initially we can start with like a hundred particles, but then in simulation, because these particles interact with the detector material, we end up with millions of particles that we need to simulate. And all this is impossible to predict. So, uh, so yeah, we've seen cases where it runs uh, sort of at the level of minutes, uh, but also it can, in some extreme cases, it can run up to one hour. I, I guess where I was going was I was wondering if, if so if you look at this as kind of an optimization problem, I guess, is you have lots and lots and lots of data that correlate some input parameters or configuration to how long it runs. And I was just wondering if there was any opportunities for analysis or some learning algorithm to be able to, to use that to, to predict um, some of the runtimes. 
Yeah, no, that's potentially very interesting. So uh, certainly we could try this um, because, yeah, so at the beginning, we really don't have that many. Uh, at the beginning, it's sort of well-defined. And then depending, for example, at which angle the initial particles uh, travel, yes, then maybe the algorithm could, could learn that it would take more time than for some other events, yeah. That's very interesting. interesting. Okay, other questions? Uh, is your, it, hey, how is your hand up? My hand is up again. Oh, it's I again, have, okay. I have tons of questions, but um, <laughs> I, um, I was wondering, um, was there something uh, that you wish the, you know, the HPC Center did, so NERSC in this case, um, that would make your workflow integration much easier? I mean, I, I know like you, you said, like they were able to set up the HTTPS node you know, to reach to pandas and, you know, but is there something that would have just made all of your life easier? Um, maybe, so, so yeah, let me, um, so let me just maybe briefly go back to this plot I had here. Uh, right, so we have these other HPCs, which there weren't much problems, just uh, to just use them. But the thing is this HPCs here, for example, Vega, it's basically used like a regular grid site. So in this case, they're just uh, running uh, sort of one of these 13 MP instance on one node. And if you want to run 100 uh, TNMP instances, they would just submit 100 uh, tasks, right? And that's something which we, I mean, just doesn't really work at, uh, at, uh, at Corey, but that's right because of the queue policies and uh, because it's much more cost efficient to run multi-node uh, jobs. But that's, that's something which may not be uh, doable, but would certainly make it easier uh, for us at least if we could treat the HPC as a regular grid set. But okay, that's maybe not, not very uh, uh, constructive. Um, so, all right, some other, so we didn't really ha have any other particular issues. I mean, the fact that we have, uh, network access, network access on compute nodes is actually really great. Um, uh, we could actually simplify this a lot because uh, because we have network access, uh, but we made it deliberately resistant um, to not having network access because, for example, some other HPCs uh, don't have it. Um, but for example, I was saying we have this eight gigabyte uh, shifted images. We could avoid this by accessing everything through network. Uh, on Cori. So for example, we could simplify it a bit in Cori. Um, um, yeah, I'm thinking if there's anything other that pops into my mind. Okay, well, if you let us know, we're interested. So we can try to try to smooth things out. I, um, another question I had, I guess, was you had um, some places where you either knew you had or you suspected there was IO probably contention or um, issues that were slowing things down. I don't know if you were, if you were able to experiment with uh, the burst buffer or if you think uh, a flash file system would, would help alleviate some of that. Right, so personally, I, had, I did not uh, try the burst buffer. Perhaps there's, I know some other folks from the Atlas group certainly tried it. Um, so, so we didn't really experience any um, audio issues during the running of the job, uh, which certainly creates a large stress on the file system because we're writing into thousands of uh, files at once. Um, but really the, the biggest problem uh, we had with IO was here on the edge node. Um, so, right, so basically we produce millions of output files and then we need to um, Concretely, what, what this harvester tries to do is tr tries to zip them into one zip file and then send them out uh, to some other site uh, where they would eventually be merged into larger binary files. So that's, yeah, well, so th we don't really yet have a good solution of how to get this output out of Cori and send it back to a grid site because this seems to cause a large, uh, a large load in the file system that we cannot handle very well. So one of the solutions we started investigating uh, was to actually do some of this cleaning up and merging on the uh, compute nodes. But that's not really ideal because uh, we want to use them to actually process the data, not to, uh, 
and to clean up and uh, and merge the data as much. Um, right. So um, right. I don't know what a good solution is, but that's one of the problems: is how to actually uh, aggregate this output and send it uh, to read. And I think this is where we have some IO issues. Okay. Right, thanks. Well, yeah, it's been very interesting. Um, we're nearing the end of the time. I want to thank you again. And um, if nobody else has any questions, um, we'll close the, the seminar today. And, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you. And thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.